All right. Good morning, attendees, and welcome to the 2020 Triangle Info CCon. Here we have Daniel Bates from Cisco. I'm just going to read a little bit about his bio just to introduce you to him. And then um, I'm going to open it up to him so he can give you his presentation and uh, give you the good stuff. All right. All right. So currently, Daniel is a solutions architect at Cisco, specializing in endpoint security, threat detection and analysis, and security education. Daniel previously worked for the Department of Defense, securing tactical, strategic, and applied research information systems everywhere from the Southwest United States to Southwest Asia. Um, that's a little bit about his bio here. Um, so there is a Q&A section in your little chat area there. If you kind of hover over it, it'll pop up. If you have any questions, just go ahead and type it there. And uh, Daniel and his colleagues here will assist. Um, but other than that, I'm gonna open the floor up to Daniel now. All right, thanks everyone for, uh, for joining the session. My name is Daniel Bates. Um, just like we said, I'm a technical solutions architect here with Cisco. I've been with Cisco for about four years and specializing in our advanced threat portfolio pretty much that whole time. So spending a lot of time working on anti-malware, sandboxing, that type of thing. What I wanna talk about today is a little bit about how we can kind of assume the mantle of a threat actor so that we can understand how they would try to breach our defenses and then ultimately find them and kick them out. So um, here's a quick agenda. We're gonna talk about the difference between a hacker and a cyber criminal. We're gonna talk about some of the tools and the tactics that they like to use and how we can identify them. Um, we're going to apply that knowledge that we're going to gain to something we call hypothesis-based threat hunting. And then at the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about how um, threat actors and, and cyber criminals tend to gain new knowledge and where we can go to learn the same types of things. So first, I want to talk about the difference between a hacker and a cyber criminal. So you'll notice from the webinar registration and the, the opening slide here, we were really careful not to use the term hacker. We, we said cyber criminal because um, most people might think of cyber criminals when they hear the term hacker, but uh, that's kind of thanks to the media. The, the term hacker is not really appropriate when we're talking about criminal activity. Hackers are not necessarily bad people. The term hack was always used to, uh, to describe someone who's trying to learn more about something or uh, figure something, figure out something, how something works. For instance, um, the MIT Tech Model Railroad Club used the term hack way back in the 1960s to talk about uh, taking apart train sets and trying to figure out how they, they function and modify how they function. So hacking really started out with that meaning of experimenting with a system, pushing the boundaries, trying to break its functions in order to learn more about it. And we still use the term in that since in software development here in Cisco, we have hackathons, which are group problem solving efforts uh, that are used to tackle big technical challenges where we try to identify uh, a problem and then come up with a novel way to fix it. Um, so hacking, not necessarily a bad thing. Um, now, when we talk about cyber criminals, what are commonly referred to as hackers, but I'm gonna use the term threat actor or cyber criminal here, um, we first need to know a little bit about how they think, how they act, and then finally how they are gonna learn or evolve over time. So how are they are motivated, what they're after? We're gonna talk about their motivations, we're gonna talk about their targets up front, and then we're gonna dive into a discussion around their tools, their tactics, techniques, and procedures, we call that TTP. And then finally, of course, how they keep their skills up to date, how they evolve their attacks to keep us uh, gainfully employed on the defensive side. So what does a threat actor want? What does a cyber criminal try to get after? So there's different motivations based on the persona of threat actor that we're talking about. For instance, you have script kiddies, typically um, low low skill or, or less skilled individuals who are gonna reuse other people's code or tools, uh, they may often not even know how the tool works. They're just gonna take something that someone else built or created and then use it. Uh, often these are just people that are trying to gain notoriety or entertain themselves in some way. 
You've got hacktivists, of course. These are people who are trying to pursue an agenda, typically trying to cause impact, not necessarily after uh, financial gain, but they're, they're definitely trying to, to make a splash or cause some type of impact. Cyber criminals were obviously digging farther into this persona than anyone else in this session because they're by far the more prevalent threat actor that we're going to face in industry. These people are after money, always, plain and simple. And then of course, nation states, they could want anything, they could really do anything to get it. These are the really high profile, interesting threat actors that we write books about, that we, that we hear about on the news. Um, they're, they're not as often gonna be seen in a, an enterprise because they have specific targets and specific ways about going after those targets. Uh, more commonly, we're gonna see the garden variety cyber criminals, but a lot of the, the tools that we'll see that cyber criminals use are adapted from or completely taken from a nation state actor's arsenal. And then what are their targets? We have to understand what a threat actor is going after so that we can defend it. And that's gonna be, of course, your systems, uh, gaining access to a domain controller or a core router. If we're talking about a hacktivist, maybe they're just trying to get after a web server so they can deface it, they can put a banner up there. Uh, or maybe they want to get some sensitive information. Um, PII or personally identifiable information, um, protected health information, um, the credit card records, the financial information like that, or just more broadly intellectual property of almost any kind that they can take back and, and sell. Or user credentials, maybe they just want to get access to someone's digital persona so they can use that as a launching point for another more sophisticated or more targeted attack. We see this often with phishing campaigns and spear phishing where an attacker will gain some level of access to an organization and then use that access to impersonate an internal user and therefore gain more trust than they would have been able to get if they had approached their ultimate target directly from the outside. So quick introduction, we're gonna spend most of our time here talking about tools, tactics, techniques, and procedures. Some of the most popular tools that we see in use today are commercially available. They're used by defenders or this new term of art called purple teams, a mix of red and blue teams that are gonna evaluate cybersecurity defenses so you have things like Cobalt Strike, which was built as a uh, penetration testing framework. Metasploit, Mimikatz, uh, PowerShell Empire. These are all extensions of or based on completely legitimate tools um, that are commercially available or open source, um, or sometimes they are just legitimate system administration tools in and of themselves like Sys internals, the, the, the PS exec and other uh, applications there, or even just PowerShell, that's already gonna be present and enabled across an enterprise right away. So why does a threat actor need to bring in custom malware that they have to spend considerable effort writing or spend a lot of capital to purchase when they can just fish some access and download a script from GitHub and then get whatever they were after in the first place. So often we will see attacks that don't even use what we would traditionally define as malware. But we know what the adversary is after, and we know some of the tools that they might try to use to get it, but we can't just add Cobalt Strike to a block list and call it a day. We have to look at the practice of threat hunting using a framework so that we can uh, get after that more in a more structured manner. There's a lot of frameworks that are in use in the industry today I'm gonna review a couple of the more common ones. On the left, we have um, Enterprise Security Control Frameworks. And I've got a picture of NIST uh, Risk Management Frameworks Special Publication, publication 800-53, 800-53 Alpha. If you have worked for a government agency, you can quote chapter and verse of either of these publications. Likewise for ISO 27001 or PCI or FISMA or COBIT, there's any number of control defining frameworks that seek to define what right should look like. Uh, here's what a password should look like. It should be this complex. It should have this many characters. It should be enforced in, in such and such of a way to make sure that people don't reuse the, the more common ones or the, the previous ones, right? A simple example of a security control that should be in place and can be audited using a security control framework. 
And these are great. These are vital for a defender to ensure that all the appropriate controls are in place and are being enforced to the correct standard. But these frameworks do not help us hunt a threat actor or an, an adversary. So in the middle, we've got the diamond model, which is a really interesting one. There's three analysts from the Center for Cyber Intelligence uh, Analysis and Threat Research Institute. They published a paper back in July of 2013, introducing a new way to model threat activity. They call it the diamond model. And in this diamond model, you've got four corners or uh, pillars where an adversary, that's one, is gonna deploy a capability, that's two, over some type of infrastructure, that's three, against a victim. And those are the four points of the diamond. They call them uh, atomic events. A series of events are then phase ordered into activity threads and then even further into activity groups. And then you can use these activity groups to understand and track an advanced persistent threat or APT, some other type of notable threat actor by their persona. It's a really interesting framework. I've got a QR code there. Um, hopefully you can, uh, you can see that and, and grab that for, for further reference if you want to. And on the right-hand side, probably the most famous threat-focused framework of the last decade, we have the Lockheed Martin Cyber Kill Chain, which is actually a trademarked uh, reference from Lock Lockheed Martin Corporation. This model was created in 2011, um, best known for its phased approach to threat activity. The Cyber Kill Chain has uh, seven phases that follow an attack through its life cycle from reconnaissance through weaponization, delivery, exploitation, uh, installation, command and control, and finally actions on objectives. And these are time ordered. They're gonna follow uh, in that order. Uh, it's an excellent way of understanding what an adversary is likely going to try to do at a high level because nearly all attacks are going to involve each of these phases in that order, nearly always in that order. And defenders can try to disrupt the attack by setting controls that would interfere with each stage. Now of these three, the cyber kill chain is probably the most interesting one for us as threat hunters, as, as defenders, because we're not examining our security posture in a vacuum, right? That's a security control framework. We're, we're not analyzing events and personas necessarily, although a skilled practitioner can make ex excellent use out of the diamond model. But we are interested in what we think a generic or even a specific actor uh, or attacker might try to do so that we can go hunt for that activity. And the cyber kill chain still has a gap. It stays at a very high level and assumes that we have the skill to translate exploitation of a vulnerability or actions on objective into a specific behavior that we can track and, and target. So it's a great way to structure a breach analysis, for instance, uh, but we can do a little bit better for pure threat hunting and trying to understand an adversary. Um, I like to use this one, MITRE ATT&CK framework. It takes a little bit of a different viewpoint on threat activity by focusing on the behaviors that an, an adversary will use to accomplish their goals, rather than focusing on the chronological stages or phases of the attack. And this enables the attack framework to go very high level with 12 tactics that I'm gonna talk about here in a moment, but also dive very, very deep into specific techniques and sub-techniques that we can use to build out a testable hypothesis. Another really great thing about MITRE is that we can build it into an automated hunt or data analysis model. And I'm gonna talk about this with a really quick demo at the end of this, this discussion. So, 12 tactics, again, these are very high level. These are not in any particular order, like the, the Lockheed, Lockheed Martin cyber kill chain. Uh, an attacker is going to use some or all or any of these in whatever order is gonna make the most sense for them, uh, likely starting with something to gain initial access, but from there they may try to evade defenses or escalate privileges or move laterally or gain credentials or do all of those things in, in some form or fashion. So going from the top initial access, that's where the attacker is trying to get into the network. With execution, the execution tactic is where an adversary is trying to run 
some type of malicious code. With persistence, the adversary is trying to maintain some type of foothold on the system. With privilege escalation, obviously they're trying to gain higher level permission than whatever they came in with. They're trying to escalate a, a user to an administrator to ultimately system perhaps, whatever they need to get uh, the, the data or the, the attack that they want to, to use. For defense evasion, the adversary is going to try to avoid being detected by your security solution. With credential access, they're going to try to steal account names and passwords. With discovery, they're trying to figure out what's in your environment, and this likely is going to lead into the lateral movement tactic, where they're trying to move through your environment and pivot across different systems to get to the one that they want to get into. For collection, they're trying to gather some type of data of interest to their goal. Command and control, that's a very familiar one. They're trying to communicate with a compromised system to give it instructions or control it in some way. Uh, for exfiltration, they're trying to steal data. And then for impact, the adversary is trying to manipulate or interrupt or destroy systems and data. So that's a tactic. Now a technique is going to go to a much deeper level and even a sub-technique uh, in some cases, you can go even, even farther still. So let's take this as an example. This is a technique and a sub-technique, operating system credential dumping within the credential access tactic. So credential access consists of techniques for stealing credentials, such as account names and passwords. And techniques that are used to get these credentials include key logging or credential dumping. Uh, this is done to give, obviously, give the access to systems, but obviously also make an adversary harder to detect because if they can gain access to a legitimate set of credentials, they can use that legitimate set of credentials and then execute things as a normal user. And it may be more difficult to, tr to track that activity if they are impersonating someone who already has access to the network. Um, and it also gives them the opportunity to create other accounts to help achieve their goals. So we're looking at tactic. Uh, Tango 1003, which is operating system credential dumping. It's one of the tactics that, or techniques that can be used to accomplish this credential access tactic. For credential dumping, adversaries might try to dump credentials to gain account logon and credential material. Uh, there's different ways that they can do that, and that's where the sub techniques come in. They can try to dump credentials from the operating system uh, from the local security authority subsystem service or LSAS. They could try to get into the security account manager. They could try to access Active Directory uh, databases, the NTDS file, or LSA, local security authority secrets, or cached domain, domain credentials. There's quite a few different sub techniques, which are very, very specific ways that an attacker would go about dumping credentials from the operating system in order to gain credential access. Right, and within MITRE, they define each of these techniques and sub-techniques so that we know exactly, specifically what we can look for. Um, they also mention how we can detect these types of techniques and sub-techniques. For instance, in this case, we can try to monitor for unexpected or uh, unauthorized processes that are trying to interact with LSAS, for instance. When someone is trying to dump credentials, they're often going to try to, uh, to attach um, the LSAS process or attached to the LSAS process and then um, dump the, the, the process itself to memory and then use a tool like Mimikatz to locate the secrets key and decrypt it from memory. Uh, you can also use process injection. You can open the, the SAM file uh, from, uh, from the local file system and try to dump it to memory. There's a, a lot of different ways that an attacker would do that. And those are all ways that we can detect it as well. So let's take this, this knowledge that we're going to get from the framework. And if we had more time here, we could spend more time digging into that MITRE framework and looking at other examples. But hopefully that was enough to, to give you an idea of what we can use the MITRE attack framework for to identify specific tactics and techniques that are of interest to us based on what we feel an adversary might try to do. So that leads us to applying this knowledge with something that we call hypothesis-based hunting. And what is hypothesis-based hunting? Well, put simply, it's really just asking the right questions to find interesting data. Hunting is prim primarily performed by a human analyst, although we're all going to use uh, automation. We're going to rely heavily on automation, especially today. 
for uh, machine assistance, but the process cannot be automated from start to finish, nor can any product perform threat hunting for an analyst. And this is because the human's key contribution to the hunt is the initial conception of what threat we would like to hunt for. We can't look for all threats. That's far too broad of a scope, but we can identify uh, some specific type of malicious activity that we want to identify in the environment and how we might go about finding it. So that is what the hunter is going to do. And that initial conception is what we call the hypothesis of the hunt. But it's really just a testable idea of what threats might be in the environment and how we can go about finding them. So if you remember back to middle school science class, this is probably gonna look really familiar. The hypothesis-driven hunting methodology is essentially the same as the scientific method. You create a, a, a hypothesis, you test it, and then you adjust it as needed to fit the conditions that you found. But when we're doing threat hunting, we need to pay very close attention to how we are testing, or in other words, how we formulate the plan and the scope for our hunt, how we execute the plan, and how we deal with the data that comes back. As an example, we might start with a hypothesis like attackers are probably going to use registry keys to establish persistence. Okay, that's great. Let's go find some registry keys. But attackers can build persistence almost anywhere. And if we start pulling entire hives across an enterprise, we're very quickly gonna get a very big pile of data and have a very difficult time figuring out what was supposed to be there and what isn't. So let's refine our scope. Let's look at some specific types of registry keys like auto run and auto start keys. And when we collect that data across our entire enterprise, we'll still have a ton of information, but we can use automated analytics to find the anomalies and reduce our burden down to, to a manageable amount. And at the end of that whole process, we take another look at our hypothesis and say, were we correct? Did we find threat activity? Or more importantly, uh, was it a good hypothesis to start with? Was it too restrictive? Was it too broad? Do we need to refine it in some way? So in our example, we were talking about persistence techniques in the registry. That's an example of a hypothesis where we don't know exactly what we're looking for. I couldn't tell you what the key value or key data would be, but I know where I want to look. And if I look there, I'll probably find something interesting. So let's dig a little bit different, a little bit deeper into different types of hypotheses. There's three main categories that I would want to talk about. There's the threat intelligent category where we use threat intelligence to develop a question. Um, or we could use situational awareness. Or third, we could leverage domain expertise, which is kind of a combination of the first two. So let's unpack these first. Threat intelligence. So intelligence can serve as the basis for the questions that an analyst might ask that would lead to the formulation of a hypothesis. So for instance, an, an IOC search or identification or indication of compromise search. There's a lot of threat intelligence out there, indicators that will say uh, a malware family like Ryuk communicates on these ports to these IP addresses and uses these file hashes or creates these registry keys or these mutexes on a system. So we can look for those. And even if an IOC search does not lead directly to generating a hypothesis, it still might discover alerts for us or log entries that we can prioritize for an investigation. So it can still be very useful. Maybe the initial IOC didn't result in a good testable hypothesis, but the results of the IOC search might. So we want to leverage IOCs for quick wins because you know, it's something that's defined. We can very easily look for it in an automated fashion, but we definitely want to try to move up the pyramid of pain to understand adversary TTPs. If you're not familiar with the pyramid of pain, got a quick reference code, uh, look at David Bianco's blog on the pyramid of pain concept. I'll summarize it really briefly. Um, the idea is how difficult can we make operations for an attacker? If we can operationalize, if we can uh, consume and make use of different levels of indicators. At the bottom, we have hash values. An attacker is not going to be very uh, concerned if we are blocking specific malware file hashes, because it's very easy for them to just repack their files to generate new uh, file hashes every time something executes. So the specificity of a hash value 
in that I have a file hash, it only ever corresponds with this one file. So if I know it to be malicious, it will always be malicious. I can easily find it and identify it as malicious. It's very specific, but that specificity kind of works against it in a threat hunting model because uh, most of our adversaries are not going to have any difficulty whatsoever in evading a file reputation check. So we go to IP addresses, which is kind of the cornerstone of a threat intelligence feed going all the way back to really the, the beginning of threat intelligence. Uh, again, same problem, um, slightly different. It's, it's not very immutable. An IP address is probably going to change. A server that's hosting malicious content today might not be hosting it tomorrow. It might be hosting a completely leg legitimate site tomorrow. With the advent of CDNs um, and, and cloud services, an IP address for an AWS uh, exit node might have nothing to do with the, the files that I'm seeing coming from it. Uh, it might be very transient. So just blocking IP addresses is probably not going to be extremely helpful. And the, the, the lifespan of the, the block list that I'm going to enforce needs to be curated because uh, something that, that was malicious yesterday may no longer be malicious and vice versa. If we go up a level to domains, now we're, we're into something a little more interesting because in order to use DNS architecture, the attacker has to register a domain. They may have to provide some type of information. It's usually anonymized or falsified. Uh, they may have to pay for the domain um, using possibly stolen credit cards. Uh, it's a little bit more effort to do that. They may have to spin up a domain generation algorithm or a DGA to programmatically create thousands of new domains. So obviously this is something they can do. They're definitely going to do it, but blocking domains is going to create a little bit of um, a speed bump for them as they try to propagate new infrastructure across the internet. Moving up a level, uh, we don't have time to go through the entire pyramid. Definitely check out that, uh, that QR code for the, the Pyramid of Pain um, blog to learn more about the, the top level indicators. But we want to move beyond these, what we call simple or atomic or computed indicators like IPs and hashes and into things like network artifacts or host artifacts, registry keys, mutexes, um, things that we can identify in a packet traversing the wire, like uh, the user agent for a web recon tool. If uh, the attacker made a mistake when they were building out that tool and there's a typo in the user agent, we can use that to identify the tool itself, uh, which is much more useful than identifying the IP address that was serving that tool. And the higher we go up this pyramid, the more challenging it is for the attacker to resume business. Um, if we get all the way up to the level of a TTP where we are denying the adversary the ability to operate the way that they like to operate, for instance, using spear phishing to deliver weaponized PDFs. Um, if they can't do that in our organization because we are so mature from a threat hunting perspective that we have denied that entire TTP, they're gonna have to reinvent themselves or find a different target to attack, which is probably what they're gonna do. So threat intelligence. Moving on to situational awareness. Defenders have to be able to understand their environment and identify when it changes in some significant way. So um, I have a, a DOD background in military doctrine. Key terrain is the term that we would use. And that refers to an area that if I control it, I have an advantage, whether I'm attacking or defending. So for instance, the top of a hill or a crossing point on a river or something like that. Um, key terrain in the, the cyberspace realm, the, the, the current term is cyber key terrain, can be a physical device like a core router or an HVAC system, or it could be a logical uh, construct like uh, authoritative DNS servers. Uh, what will actually serve DNS records for the, the resources that I own or privileged accounts or databases? So as an example, if I'm a, a, in the process of acquiring a company, we're doing a merger, do I trust the other organization? Probably not to the level that I trust my organization. So let's put additional security inspection at the gateway between our networks, because that's an example of uh, a hypothesis uh, where I suspect that there could be threat activity coming in at that border. Uh, I've got a QR code here for MITRE's uh, crown jewels analysis process, which is part of their systems engineering guide, which has a really good description of how to develop and identify what they call the crown jewels. Same thing as key terrain, just uh, more of an industry term there. And then finally, domain expertise. 
This is personal or team or research acquired experience. So it's important to be a subject matter uh, expert and have a good professional network. Um, if I am working in, um, if I like an ISP, for instance, and I know that um, adversaries are targeting my peers by manipulating border gateway protocols, that's something that I can key in on. That's something that I can look for that I would only know because I have expertise in that area. But we have to be wary of cognitive bias here because my personal domain expertise may influence me to create a hypothesis that would only relate to a threat that I've seen before. I might miss some more obvious or more useful hypotheses or, or hunts um, by just focusing on things from my background. Um, so the, the, the QR code here is linking to a presentation from uh, someone named Chris Sanders who's talking about defeating cognitive bias by developing analytic techniques. He presented it at, uh, at a B-Sides conference in Augusta uh, a while ago. Definitely worth checking out if you have the time. So threat intelligence, uh, situational awareness, and domain expertise. If we try to combine aspects of all three types of hypotheses, um, mix them all together, we'll be more likely to come up with a good testable question that will result in threat discovery. But I want to pause here and make a quick note that it's important to leave time for the actual hunt. So we don't want to spend all of our time coming up with the perfect hypothesis and no time for actually implementing it. Deploying a flawed hypothesis may not result in a successful hunt, right? The hunt might fail, but failing is part of the process. And it's going to lead to a better understanding of our practice and our environment and increased security, even if nothing was detected that first time. So use the one-thirds, two-thirds rule. Don't hesitate to try new things, whether they succeed or not. The important thing is, what did we learn from this hunt? How can we bring it back? All right, so I'm gonna do a quick demonstration of how we can automate some threat hunting with Orbital. Um, this is not necessarily product specific. I'm just using the products that I, that I have access to. So we're starting with a hypothesis. And that is, in this case, Threat actors are escalating privileges using a user account control or user access control bypass or UAC bypass technique. Um, that's 1548 um, sub technique two. So that's my starting point. And I'm gonna look for ways that a threat actor might do that. So in this case, I'm gonna use something called Orbital. Um, you could maybe have access to OS query, the same framework. Um, Cisco has implemented it as, uh, as Orbital with some, some extensions to functionality. Um, but anyway, I'm going to look for techniques that map to that attack technique for bypassing user account control. And we've got a few that we can look at. So I'm going to pick one of them. I'm going to select it here. I'm going to query my environment for that. Um, in this case, I might want to schedule it as a job that I would run every day for a week. And I might want to compare the results over time. So I can schedule that out, I can run it, and then I can use my automated tools to look at the results. I've got an example of some JSON that would uh, potentially come back from that query where I can look for things that had exploited UAC bypass and compare them with the rest of the, the baseline activity in my, in my network and hopefully make some good discoveries. Or if not, you know, bring it back and identify where my process might have broken down and refine my hypothesis and go from there. So very short demonstration there. Hopefully it gives you some ideas of, of how you could take this kind of theoretical knowledge of MITRE ATT&CK and the frameworks and everything and, and bring it into a real threat hunt. Now the final part of our, our agenda today was talking about how a cyber criminal is going to learn their craft and stay educated and evolve over time. So Really, they do it the same way that we all do. Some formal education, uh, security conferences, just like this one, looking at other people's work on GitHub and, and, and so on. Of course, Twitter is a huge resource. Finding out what the, the other minds in the industry are doing and learning from them, learning new techniques and, and new tactics. So this is what the, the adversary is doing. This is what our opposition is doing. We can do the same thing. As long as we stay plugged in to what's going on and we, we are constantly learning and trying to advance our own knowledge of the field, 
we're going to be able to keep up with the adversary and know what they're trying to do and how they're trying to do it and build our defenses the same way. So the important thing here is to stay hungry for knowledge and to stay learning. Um, going to the conferences like Triangle InfoSecCon, uh, which is a, a huge part of my personal uh, success as a, a security analyst and researcher, um, is coming from conferences like this where you can learn about what other people in the, in the industry are doing and then apply it to daily life. So that's definitely something to do. I've got one final QR code here, and this is a white paper on how to generate hypotheses for successful threat hunting. It came from two of the probably the biggest stars in the threat analyst space, Robert Lee and David Bianco from the SANS Institute. So check that out. Um, a lot of the information in this presentation ultimately came from uh, resources like this one. So I want to pause here for a second, see if there's any questions that uh, we want to answer live. I have a couple of panelists that have been working in the, the Q&A panel. All right, guys. And if you want to write those questions, there's a QA section down there, um, right in your uh, lower little bar there. Just type your questions in there and we can answer them one by one. Um, if you want to raise your hand, we can also do it that way. But I'm going to leave the ball up in you guys court, um, QA or raise hand. We have plenty of time here. I think we got about 24 minutes. So uh, you guys can go ahead and ask those questions. All right, so Jesse asked the question, how do we decide if a hypothesis is not the case? So how do we decide if a hypothesis is just, just not good? We need to start over again. Um, so it depends on the results that are coming back. Um, there is a really interesting question, whether you're doing hypothesis-based threat hunting or you're just using a, a system or a tool to, to look for something using its own threat intelligence, even as simple as uh, an antivirus product that's got definitions and threat intel. Um, if we don't get results, does that mean there is nothing to find? Or does that mean that we missed the attacker? That's a really good question. It's gonna keep you up at night, most likely. Um, so it's a judgment call, right? We, we have to decide based on our experience if it's worth pursuing this anymore because there's always gonna be other threats out there that we can try to focus on. Um, maybe it's not really worth chasing down this idea that I have that an attacker has compromised the the, the bootloader in one of my um, thermostats and is trying to use that as a, a launching point, right? I've been watching too much Mr. Robot. Um, maybe I want to focus on a more useful threat like an attacker is phishing my users and using that to generate um, fully signed internal um, threat campaigns that are targeting my C levels, for instance. Um, so, it's going to depend on how much time, how much, how much resources you have to pursue the, the hypothesis. But ultimately, if we're not getting any results, uh, it, and we've, we've, we feel like we have achieved specificity, right? we're not just swimming in data, we, we have a, a good data set, and we're still not seeing anything. Uh, if we don't have a reason to continue down that path, it's probably time to maybe pick a different hypothesis. All right, great, very informative answer there. Um, again, guys, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. Even, even if they're minor questions, anything on your mind, just go ahead and ask. If it's relative to security or even you know career-wise, um, you can go ahead and put that in there and uh, we'll be happy to help you out.
I've got a question for you guys. This is my first virtual InfoSecCon. Uh, how do you guys like it so far? It's a little bit different, right? Yep, and you guys can also utilize the chat feature. I got another question here. Um, how do we build a hypothesis? What's the kind of a general process? Um, so yeah, a lot of the information is gonna be in this paper, but I'll try to summarize it really quick. So you, you would try to go after one of those three general types of hypotheses. Um, for instance, threat intelligence. It's a really good starting point. Um, there's an advisory that came out uh, over the weekend from the FBI that says there's uh, some threat actors that are targeting healthcare with Ryuk ransomware. So they're specifically going to go after uh, healthcare. And it's, uh, it's very concerning because healthcare environments, like many, but especially healthcare, have a lot of legacy devices that have to be connected um, in order to function, but also can't be patched because the manufacturer just hasn't patched them and they, they have to be certified. And it's not as simple as just, you know, releasing the, the latest patch Tuesday updates. So you have a situation there where you know you're gonna get attacked. You know that you have highly vulnerable uh, devices on the network. So you'd probably wanna build a very specific hypothesis that says, you know, we, we have very good credible intelligence that we are gonna be affected or targeted with this type of ransomware by this type of threat actor what can we do to look for it to see if they're already probing our network? So we might look at the threat intelligence that's coming off of those advisories. Um, obviously put them on a watch list, make sure that if we have any information on where they might be coming from, the IPs, the domains, the, the files they might be using to try to get in, uh, email subject lines if they're trying to fish people, um, any of that information we might try to you know, to look for those specifically because we have that credible um, high confidence threat of, of something happening soon. So that's a good example of, of what I would be doing in a real world situation like today. Um, I would be looking for evidence of that type of activity. More generally, if I don't, if I don't have one of those kind of emergent situations going on, um, I'm probably just going to go through um, the MITRE framework, to be honest. Uh, I'm going to look at the, the different tactics that are out there, the ones that make the most sense to me. There's a bunch of things to choose from, but I might be most interested in, for instance, if, if I go through that crown jewels analysis process and I've decided that the most important resource at my organization is intellectual property. Maybe I am a pharmaceutical researcher or I do engineering work. Um, and I know that, th that threat actors out there are trying to steal my information and my documents I might be very interested in the ways that an attacker might get in to try to get those documents. And, and I would try to, to plan it out. Uh, this is where that purple teaming kind of comes into play. If I was a threat actor and I wanted to get access to this information or this system or this resource, how would I go about it? And you'll quickly identify some maybe easy things that an, a threat actor could do. And then just turn those into a hypothesis and say, if I think that a threat actor is gonna try to do these things, let's look for that. Let's look for any evidence of that. Um, and then whenever you do a hunt, you try to you know, look for the results. If you like the results, automate it. And then from that point on, you hunt once, you get the results forever. So actually that was an example of, the first one was Ryuk. That was a threat intelligence hypothesis. Uh, and the second one was a situational awareness hypothesis. And then uh, of course, a domain expertise hypothesis is a little bit of both where um, maybe no one's told you, but you just know that something is likely to target you in a certain way. Um, that's something that, that is only going to come with time. Uh, we had a question asking uh, advice to give to someone looking to make a discipline change within information security. This is a really interesting question. We get a lot of, of people that are looking to break into InfoSec, maybe from another discipline of of information technology, like uh, you know, network admin or a systems admin that's trying to go into security. Um, but this is a really interesting one because it's someone who's already in information security, like working as a systems engineer, uh, maybe you manage a, a firewall or a, an IPS or something like that. 
um, and you want to move into a threat focused role or a threat hunting role. So I think that the most important thing you can do if you want to move across disciplines is build your own personal skill set. I'm not talking about certification, although if you're trying to go after a certification like OSTP, that's definitely going to help you learn as you go along that journey. But uh, most of the threat analysts that I talk to that are looking for you know, new people on their teams, because they all are, they're all looking for, for more resources um, and, and more people in the industry, and they all pretty much say the same thing. They don't really care what uh, a person has on paper. They care about their hunger for knowledge, the, the way that they approach a problem, the way that they can think creatively. Um, and they're looking for people who are driven to learn more and to do more. So building that kind of mindset, that's something that you can practice just like you can practice a physical skill. You can practice how you can approach a problem, uh, doing things like CTFs, uh, hack the box competitions. Um, actually, hack the box is a specific resource that can be very useful um, going after um, systems that have been compromised or are, are very vulnerable to a compromise and figuring out what that is and getting root access. Uh, it's a very interesting process and can build a lot of that skill. And as you go through that, you're going to develop those skills. You're going to develop familiarity with the, the tools and the frameworks, and more importantly, the ways that people do threat hunting. Um, and, and that's probably going to open some opportunities for you. It's kind of a generic answer, but um, let me know if that was helpful at all. Um, okay, here's one. Um, I'm just going to quote it. In my security education, I've typically seen threat actors portrayed as fringe or foreign elements, has recent history unveiled unethical or clandestine actions initiated by otherwise legitimate businesses or entities such as industrial espionage. That is a really good question. I do not think that I can answer that um, because I don't have that specific knowledge. And if I did, I don't know that I could talk a whole lot about it. But uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely that stuff happens. Of course it does. Um, we always like to think of the, the hacker as kind of one or two, one of two personas. There's the, the 300 pound guy in his mom's basement eating Cheetos and hacking the planet, right? That doesn't really exist. It's a great stereotype though. It plays well on television. And then we also think about the, the foreign nation state hackers that are trying to get after all of our stuff. And that's another thing that does exist, but not really to the, the level that we think it does. Um, cyber criminals, like we've been talking about, are, it's a big business. A lot of organized crime has turned to, um, to, to cybersecurity as a way of making money. So you've got ransomware, you've got uh, Bitcoin mining or cryptocurrency mining, you've got extortion schemes. Um, there's a lot of emerging trends in threat that are driven primarily by cyber criminals. Um, and I would say also by unethical organizations that are looking for a, an unfair advantage. Um, those types of things are always gonna be out there. Um, I don't think I have any specific case studies or anything to point to. Uh, maybe history will show, but yeah, it's not always uh, coming from an IP address from halfway across the world. All right, guys, we are approaching our 10 minute mark uh, before we have to end at 1230. Um, if you have any other questions, go ahead and drop it in that QA section and uh, we can keep working on that. Um, but yes, this will be open until 1230. Um, but if you have any questions, go ahead and uh, type them in there. Steve said he likes the virtual format and uh, wants to do it again next year. Well, we might be able to. I was just thinking, I, I kind of miss grabbing a coffee and a breakfast pastry and talking about stuff with other people. But and then I realized I can talk to other people and I have my own coffee. So I'm, I'm pretty much set. This, uh, this format works for me too.
All right, we got some great questions. I appreciate everyone coming out. Um, I know you guys have, have been through quite a few sessions already from yesterday and uh, earlier today. Got some more on the, on the docket for the rest of the day. I definitely appreciate you stopping by with, with ours. We'll be here for a few more minutes answering questions, but uh, I know a lot of people are probably going to grab a quick break before their next one. All right, anonymous attendee is asking, in TV and movies, terms like the dark web are thrown around a lot. How often do we come across things like the dark web and how accurate is it to things that we see on TV? Uh, the dark web definitely exists. It's a thing that's out there. Um, it is definitely not as portrayed on TV. Um, how, to, how to describe this? Um, there are a lot of places where um, threat actors will kind of gather to talk about what they're doing, coordinate things, um, sell, often sell services. So um, threat as a service is, a, is definitely a thing. If I build a, um, a tool that is really useful to me, I might use it myself or I might try to turn that into a revenue stream by selling it to other people. So we see a lot of botnets that have gone that way. Um, you can rent access to a botnet or a, a, you know, a rent access to a, a DDoS um, tool, which is typically a botnet. So I might go through the, the, the trouble of compromising a couple million IoT devices out there and then sell my services, um, you know, hire me to hire my stuff to go do your thing. That's definitely done, um, frequently done on, uh, you know, not in, in the, the clear internet. You know, you, you can't just Google for those sites. Um, but that doesn't mean that they are not really well known. Um, every threat intel shop that I have ever talked to um, has people tracking that activity. Um, often has people in the, the, the hacking forums, so to speak. Um, participating, you know, getting really interesting human intelligence on what's going on. Um, there's, there's a whole world out there of, of people who are doing that. It's, it reads kind of like a, a spy novel with some of the things that they do. Um, but yeah, that's, that's definitely out there. So I would say TV, as TV does, is going to over sensationalize something and, and use the dark web as uh, kind of a get out of jail free card for poor script writing. Um, some TV shows get it more right than others. Um, I actually, I, I made kind of a joke about Mr. Robot, but that show did get it right. Um, very right. That was a good show. Uh, if it's like CSI, almost, almost assuredly going to be uh, incorrect. Uh, Tate is asking, if we want to focus on cybersecurity defense, how do we develop the mindset to understand attacks without actually attacking stuff? Um, good question. Well, we do have to understand attacks and that's typically done by attacking things. We just have to make sure that we do it in a nice way um, and that we attack things that can be attacked, that we, that we have permission to attack. So that's where like Hack the Box is a great resource because we can deploy whatever offensive security tools that we want against a system that's designed to be attacked. Um, we, we're not going to go out there and, you know, hack someone's actual system. That's a cross. Time. We definitely don't want to do that, um, but we can build labs or we can use other people's learning resources um, to, to go into something. Uh, so that's offensive. If I want to use Metasploit or Meterpreter or Mimikatz and dump credentials out of LSAS, like I was talking about earlier, if I want to learn how to do that, I can do that on Hack the Box or any number of other platforms that for, for learning that type of technique. Or what I've done on, on my own is I just fire up a VM and and just mess around with it and see if I can get 
you know, see if I can defeat something. Um, it's easier to use pre-built service like Hack the Box. I'm using that one just because I'm most familiar with it um, because often an exploit that I want to research is only going to be available on a certain version of Windows, for instance. If I try to, to, um, to dump credentials off of a currently patched Windows 10 build, I'm going to have a much harder time than if I go after a Windows 7 box that hasn't been patched in eight years. Um, and I may not have access to all those images and I may not want to build the environment that I want to attack that way. So it's easier to let someone else do that and provide that to me as a service. That's one of the really valuable things about that type of platform. But um, I can definitely, like it's one of my pet projects is that whole firmware cross-loading thing. I can just do that on my own. Um, if I want to, I can get some IoT devices and see how I could run Linux on them. That's definitely been done. Um, so I, I think the mindset has to be, has to come from me. It has to come, you know, from my own motivation, um, how hungry I am to learn and to, to improve. There's definitely some nights where all I want to do is just sit down and watch terrible, terrible TV and, you know, not do anything productive. Um, but uh, the more nights that I have where I'm hunting and I'm, I'm learning and I'm hacking away at stuff, um, the, the better I get. Another kind of generic non uh, answer, but I don't want to sound like a self-improvement author. Um, the motivation has to come from within you, but it really does. Good question. Yeah, that was a very good explanation of that. Um, yes, so we have passed our five minute mark uh, for warning. We are at about three minutes left. Um, so we're going to be shutting it down very shortly here. If anybody has anything quick to say, um, you can. Um, if you want to give him a, a quick applause for this great presentation, that would be very much appreciated because he, he did an amazing job um, with what he presented to us. And we do appreciate him for coming out. So if you want to give him a quick applause, that would be much appreciated. And again, thanks to everyone for coming out and special thanks to the, the Triangle InfoSecCon staff for hosting this. None of this would happen without a whole bunch of work that went on the back end. Um, so this was a huge effort and uh, a lot of fun. Yes, also, that Cisco umbrella booth, that's a very good idea there. Um, if you just go to our exhibit hall in our lobbies, they will be right there on that list. Just click on it. It'll take you uh, to their pers their uh, information there and you can learn more about them. Um, we got about one minute left. I just wanna thank Daniel for doing this amazing presentation and teaching us how to think like a hacker and also just giving us some overall information on cybersecurity itself. Um, so I'm just going to be shutting this down here in a moment. Uh, we do thank you guys for partici participating in the 2020 InfoCCon, and we hope you guys have an amazing rest of your day. And Daniel, once again.